viewers and it is my pleasure to welcome you for another round of stakeholder outreach initiative by p3 world council today i i bring you to a beautiful country from south asia called sri lanka i'm based out of india and one thing that connects all of us in asia is tea and cricket and sri lanka is known for its variants of tea basically so today we have with us a person who has worked with the ppp unit of sri lanka Mr. Thilan Vijay Singhe. Before we begin, let me give you a brief introduction of Thilan. Thilan is an investment banker, entrepreneur, and angel investor, and graduate of Cornell University. He was also the youngest ever chairman of the board of investment, where he pioneered PPP transactions in Sri Lanka from 1996 to 2000, financially closing transactions in sectors like ports, power, telecom, affordable housing, and hospitals. Thilan then ran Sri Lanka's two largest public listed property companies from 2017 to 2019 Thilan served as chairman of the National Agency for Public of TW Corp and investment banking advisory that specializes in corporate finance PPPs and strategy consulting Welcome Thilan and thank you so much for taking some time out out of your, out of your busy schedule to have an interaction with us. Thank you for inviting. All right. Uh viewers, the reason we are focusing on the market of Sri Lanka is because Sri Lanka is tourism centric first of all and second thing the country has just seen a change of leadership where we expect a lot of new announcements and a new projects being announced by the government. Thilan, my first question to you is what that what we are trying to understand from different markets is how ha how has been the impact of the covid-19 on sri lanka especially considering the four sectors that it focuses on the impact has been very significant uh, in fact uh, as you mentioned tourism has been obviously hit very badly sri lanka has had double digit growth in tourism for the last 10 years uh, and uh, much investment is ongoing as well as much new investment was anticipated so therefore tourism being the, the 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 most severely affected followed by uh, the export industry uh, sri lanka as you as you are aware is is uh, exporting apparel uh, which is its largest export earner at the mid to higher segment of the market so the the, the weaknesses in the us market such as companies like victoria secret who manufactures about 30% of their apparel products in sri lanka has had an impact on our export sector and obviously uh, uh the banking and financial sector also is stressed uh, particularly in considering that the government stimulus package uh for uh, relating to covid uh, was roughly between 1 to 2% of gdp which is relatively small compared to the global average and that is a reflection of the fact that uh, sri lanka's fiscal position uh, as of end of last year was relatively weak so the banks have had to bear a brunt of the uh, burden on some of the fiscal stimulus aspects so not that the banking system is unstable our banking system is very stable but it has obviously taken a hit on their uh, balance sheets okay okay all right um thilan we've been following the news on sri lanka and um, as i mentioned in my introduction the country has just seen a change of leadership how do you see it uh, impacting or affecting uh, the uh, the business environment in the country Yes so in November we saw a, a new president getting elected and we should have had a new parliament in March however covid pushed that back to uh, August and for the first time since 1978 we have a government that has a two third majority and one of the key okay. reasons for the government winning a, a, a two third majority in the general election that was concluded a few weeks back was the effectiveness with which the incumbent president handled the pandemic as soon as it was uh, apparent yes. that certain proactive action had to be taken so effectively uh, the sound management techniques that were used in sri lanka was seen as reflection of the ability of the government to navigate itself out of the economic downturn and therefore uh, the fact that you have now the prime ministers who controls the parliament and the president from the same party is considered to be a positive factor by the business community unlike the previous government where the president was from one party and the prime minister was from another and there were many uh, policy conflicts and economic 
as uh, bottlenecks that, that the country had to face as a consequence. So I, I, I wish to state that in summary, business is looking at this current change with a sense of optimism uh, in terms of having unified leadership to come out of the uh, economic uh, downturn that we've had to face as a consequence of COVID. Okay, all right. One thing that you, one thing that a point that you mentioned was a, a unison basically between between the political parties, and it's good. I mean, what you mentioned, the the type of um, the parliamentary system that Sri Lanka has, considering the, the president and the prime minister, it is important that um, you need to have a, a unification in regards to approaching some common policies and common goals. Um, one thing that you mentioned, uh, Tilan, and when I want to really, you know, have this discussion. And uh, having read about uh, the developments in Sri Lanka over the past one and a half year, two years, I've been following the news. And you have been the chairman of uh, the PPP unit in Sri Lanka. So uh, what we read is um, the, the, the PPP unit is no more functional. I mean, can you please highlight uh, what has been the reasons? One of, thing, one of the things that I understand from what you mentioned just now is the difference of uh, the, the political opinions or it being a difference between the president and the prime minister. Have these contributed or are, are, are there any other driving factors because of which the PPP unit had to be dissolved? No, that perception is incorrect, uh, I must say, at the outset. There was uh, never any disagreement between the president and the prime okay. minister on account of uh, what to do with the PPP agency. So let me give you a little bit of history because I have been personally involved in directing at least 60% of the largest PPPs that have been implemented in this country in the last 22 years. So when okay. PPPs were initially launched in Sri Lanka, it was done under my chairmanship of the Board of Investment commencing in 1996 when I set up a new unit called the Bureau of Infrastructure Investment. And despite the country being in a conflict situation, we were successful in financially closing about a billion dollars of various transactions that you mentioned in your introduction. Now, subsequent to my departure, the PPPs were handled by various other line ministries and it was not entirely successful. And therefore, a new PPP unit, what was called the PPP agency, was set up under the finance ministry and I was invited to be the inaugural chairman of the uh, PPP agency, which I did on an honorary basis. Now, with the advent of the new government, it was a decision taken by the bureaucracy, not by the political authorities. It was decided that it was best to shift the PPP capability back to the Board of Investment under the okay. chairman and the board of uh, directors of the BOI. Now, okay. now I, my, my, my position, I, in fact, I was not asked to uh, request to resign from my position, but in principle, I disagreed with the decision and therefore about five weeks after the election of the new president on a matter of principle I resigned from my position as uh, chairman of the PPP agency allowing the new government to implement its thought process and see okay. how it progress so 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 obviously I'm extending whatever help to the board of investment uh, when, when, my, when my advice is asked for but I'm very much now back in the private sector and uh, the PPPs will, will will be now implemented under the direction of the BOI in consultation with the various line ministries. Okay, okay. So what I understand from you is it is just like uh, restructuring has taken place. Uh, the PPP unit is just, you know, uh, the, the, it has changed and gone into the Bureau, Bureau of Board of uh, Investments. Is that what I'm understanding from you? Yes. As of yes, now. Yes. So are there currently any PPP projects operational in the country? Sri Lanka has had amongst the most successful track records in PPPs. Uh, going back, okay. as I was mentioning in 97, when we closed the first PPP transaction, we have got okay. about at least $6 billion of PPPs financially closed and operational, and not even okay. one has failed. Zero. That's Zero failures. That's and, and the primary reason for that is our sound regulatory and legal framework. So from the first PPPs okay. that I was involved in directing, that was from hydro energy to thermal energy to telecommunication, what was mentioned earlier, including South Asia's first ever port terminal, BOT, all of them now 20 years on have proven to be successful. So, so therefore, um, there is a sound body of work as well as legal framework on which any government can build on 
Um, and, and, and therefore, um, I believe that uh, Sri Lanka should be looked at as a mature market for public-private partnerships going forward. Correct. Correct. Uh, Kila, one thing that you mentioned, and I, I would want to understand from you, because to tell you frankly, uh, we've been interacting with a lot of PPP units and governments across uh, different continents. Somewhere certain projects and certain units are successful, somewhere it is not. What you mentioned right now, I mean, what I understand is from 1997, that's a fair bit, that's a long amount of time, it's close to around 20, 20 22 years, um, I see. And one factor that you mentioned was that uh, uh, the regulatory, a robust regulatory framework uh, that Legal has framework. enabled it to have some successful projects. Mm -hmm. Apart from this, because see, we have seen a lot of developments in the markets. The markets, if you see currently, are, are highly uncertain. They are dynamic. Uh, in all this, apart from the regulatory aspect, do you see any other factor that has impacted or you know, that has helped to have such success in PPP projects in Sri Lanka? Yes, more than the regulatory framework, I must correctly say it's a legal framework. And if I were to consider a regulatory framework, it would be primarily what we call the Board of Investment Law and the, and the investment laws that are prevailing in the country. Um, okay. So, so your question is what else has led to the success? And, and in some instances, yes. even the lack of success would be whenever a PPP program of a government has been successful, and that is when there was political leadership and clarity of policy and consistency of policy uh, prevailed. Um, and, and if you look at successful PPPs that were closed, uh, it was at a time when the government had a core competent team that, was, that comprised both the private sector as well as public sector professionals working together. And every okay. time that you have had PPPs being handled entirely with public sector officials who did not have the relevant experience and there was policy inconsistency, there have been either delays or certain PPPs that were closed were renegotiated. And there was one such uh, PPP project, which is now called, which is called Port City, which was financially okay. closed under a previous government. And the following government chose to renegotiate the PPP agreement. And it was successfully okay. negotiated and launched. Now that now the reason for the, uh, the the renegotiation was at that time there was no central PPP unit that took overall responsibility for all aspects from start to finish of the transaction, from the commercial negotiations okay. to the legal structuring, coordination with the Attorney General's Department. So, so to summarize, really. Um, the, the speed at which a PPP can be concluded uh, has been a direct function of A, there being a central PPP unit or agency that is manned by both private sector and public sector professionals, number one. Number two, there being technical assistance funding to hire transaction advisors being available. And often uh, Sri Lanka has relied on funding from agencies such as the World Bank and, and, and ADB and uh, USAID in securing such technical funding. And this technical funding uh, makes it possible for the central PPP unit staff uh, to hire world experts, whether it is legal, technical, or, 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 or specialists in a particular field to be hired from whatever part of the world. So, for example, Correct. when I was directing the first ever port sector BOT, we hired experts, okay. port sector experts out of New York, okay. out of London. Um, so, so, all these elements have to come together where the central agency should have an allocation of funding, uh, okay. whilst the core team typically should have financial structuring and legal strengths. But that okay. of funding should be available to hire any global experts because these are inherently complex negotiations and complex transactions. Okay, okay. All right. That's great to know. So one thing that uh, I'm just picking up points that you just mentioned as a best practice, because one thing that you mentioned is, uh, and one problem that everybody faces across the world is the bankability of the PBB projects. And, you know, you project the trust and the confidence for global stakeholders to come and be a part of your ecosystem in the country. That is something that most of the countries face. I mean, in my interactions, uh, that has been, I mean, financing of PPP projects has been one of the major issues. And what you're highlighting is, I mean, that's wonderful point that you mentioned that PPP units had the participation of not only public, but as well as private sector stakeholders, because of which there was a balance that was achieved. And that's a good learning that uh, we all can have, that the PPP units should definitely have 
participation and inclusion of um, even the, uh, the the private sector. Uh, moving on, what I want to ask you, just mention right now, Pilar, that uh, because of the funding received from uh, different investors and uh, multilateral uh, bodies or uh, financial institutions, you were able to hire the best of the best experts from across the world. Now, what I want to understand is, uh, PPPs, as I understand from what you're saying, is quite old in Sri Lanka. How have you managed the entire capacity building and skill development aspect of uh, PPPs in your country? Because uh, I'm sure entirely we can't rely on external resources. We need to build local uh, resources as well. So can you just share your experience on that as well? It's been primarily achieved through interactions with the line ministries and continuous programs of training. So one of the approaches that uh, I followed in, uh, you know, between 2017 to 2019 was in addition to training of the core staff members of the PPP unit, we had specific training programs with every line ministry that would play host to a PPP transactions, whether it's power, petroleum, etc. cetera. Uh, and also uh, several study tours were, were arranged for uh, specific members of these line ministries to understand what how PPPs are structured. Now the way okay. that PPPs are progressed in Sri Lanka is that we have, uh, whilst the central u central unit works on the coordination aspects, we have we have what are called cabinet appointed negotiating committees and project committees for each transaction, and these are okay. the, the these are public officials who represent the various stakeholder groups for that particular public private partnership. And okay. it's a project committee that, for example, that does all the legwork, whereas the cabinet appointed negotiating committee is more like a board of directors who provides a relevant policy guidance and is typically okay. comprised of secretaries. So, so this overall hierarchy, uh, in order to manage the transaction well, technical assistance is required. So. So often PPP unit staff, as well as external consultants, participate in these project committee discussions and negotiations with the project okay. and the proponents. So, Absolutely. So, so, yeah. so, so it is extremely important in a PPP transaction that, that the, the, the negotiating team's capacity is, is built to the point where it can undertake a negotiation with the, with the winning bidder or, 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 or implement a bidding process on a, on a literally equal basis, because if the private party actually has an upper hand yeah. over, the, over the government, then the risk sharing yeah. becomes convoluted and you end up with a, with, with, with a relatively bad transaction from the government's perspective. Correct. So Correct. Achieving, Correct. achieving that balance is, is absolutely crucial. No, one thing, I mean, that's a, that's a very brilliant point where you, know, where you, where you included the, the, the participants or the people who are going to handle on actual transactions and actual uh, projects that were running. And that gave a, a real-time perspective about how a PPP project is run. And that is like, I would rather say like an on-job training uh, and nothing nothing better than having a classroom training of understanding what are the nuances and dynamics of a PPP project. Uh, that's a good learning, uh, Tilan, because uh, as P3 World Council, definitely we do have uh, capacity building programs. But uh, uh, it is it is a it is a welcome thing for uh, you know to have it included with regards to uh, uh, practical program. How would you suggest Thailand? Uh, because see, there are certain countries which are just trying to you know understand and uh, adopt PPPs. So what? How would you advise with regards to uh, for those countries which don't have any PPP projects running uh, for them to train their local staff or the local uh, talent out there for PPP projects? The most important thing is for there to be continuity of those people who are trained. That basic fundamental training is absolutely important, no question. Okay. Now, okay. If, a, if, a, if a government is to accelerate and fast track the process of PPPs, obviously you have to attract outside talent. I myself have been an investment banker most of my life. So I was headhunted by the f a former government to make, become chairman of the BUI. And then the former okay. secretary of the treasury said, Ilan, you have the required investment structuring background to set this thing up. So, so government should take similar proactive views, even if it make, means paying market salaries, it, you must attract both public and private sector professionals to that central unit. So, 
So you must take the salary equation off the table. In fact, when I was first hired in 1990, late 1995, there was a parliamentary debate because my salary happened to be three times that of the president of Sri Lanka, but it was 30% lower than what I was earning in the private sector. But, okay, okay. but not that I'm, I, I'm, I'm trying to pat myself on the back, but the results are there to show because at a time where we had a war risk premium, we managed to close financial transactions, which means we knew Correct. I had an understanding of what bankability was. So yes. that fundamental understanding of direct and indirect fiscal risk bankability is crucial for a government to uh, be in a position to hire a properly risk weighted PPP transaction. So, so my advice to any government country organization that is setting up PPPs, do not compromise on the human resource, core human resource skill that you need to build. And it must be yeah. a team that is there for the long haul, not Correct. one ad hoc team for one transaction and another ad hoc team for another transaction. It is not going to work because across every PPP, there's a common thread. And that yes. common thread is what are the key risk sharing clauses? What are the key bank bankability clauses? What should be in an implementation agreement? What should be in a direct, uh, 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 direct lenders agreement with banks? What should be in a concession agreement? There are certain common elements. And correct, the, correct. the final point I want to make is you have to have the country's attorney general's department or its equivalent buy into the process because all concession legal agreements finally are subject to vetting and review by the attorney general's department. So the unit has a legal department that continuously coordinates with the attorney general's department so that the, prior to submitting the final agreements for approval by the cabinet and the attorney general, there's continuous back and forth feedback so that right at the beginning of a transaction, we identify any issues that may be contrary to the country's laws or the constitution or certain other statutes that which may, which may be in conflict with the concession agreement or, uh, that, that we are formulating for the PPP agreement. So final comment is that each PPP unit must have a proper and carefully selected advisory board, board of directors, et cetera, drawn again from the public sector and the private sector, um, who would advise that co-management team. So that would be in summary, my advice on how you can create the correct foundation to have a successful CPP program. So one thing that I, what I, what I learned from this is, I mean, to not compromise on the quality of the human resources, because those are the ones which are absolutely key to any PPP project. That's what I'm understanding from Pilan. Pilan, I want to ask you one thing. Now, you since you mentioned uh, uh, multi repeatedly uh, a word known as the bankability. Now, this word has been, uh, you know, uh, it's like chased by many. I mean, across everywhere, people want to see uh, the trust and the bankability of projects. Along with what you mentioned at the beginning of a conversation that yes, regulatory frameworks are important and those contribute to the bankability of a project. So apart from that, what do you suggest from your experience of 20 years on uh, working on PPP projects? What makes a project bankable? If you can just highlight two, three, top three or top four, five uh, points that you know our viewers can take away or the stakeholders can understand or governments can understand that these are the five points that if implemented, you can have some good bankable PPP projects that can attract global investments. Well, first and foremost, a bankable, PPP project would have to have a strong legal foundation. Um, okay. And that, that particular legal foundation, having the support of the finance ministry of, of a country is absolutely crucial because we have found in Sri Lanka that many complex PPP transactions have a foundation of generally three three core agreements you have a series one or a series of concession agreements right which tells you how the ppp would operate what would be the risk sharing model Correct. then you have what we call an implementation agreement now implementation agreements come into play when a particular government agency that is signatory to the ppp agreements are owned by the finance ministry for example the power generation 
uh, unit or agency of the government, which has to write a check every month for the generation of power or a toll road agency that has to do a viability gap pop up. So, yes. so the implementation agreement is crucial because what the implementation agreement does is that the finance ministry agrees to make the required allocations to the line agency that is signing the PPP agreements that these annual fiscal allocations will be made. It is not a sovereign guarantee. It is a legal contractual agreement. The third element is often in countries where developing countries in particular, there's what is called a direct lenders agreement where the lenders, the private sector lenders or international lenders to a particular PPP project want certain stepping rights in the event that there is a systemic failure in the, in the, in the form of uh, the PPP investor. There's a PPP investor, there's a bankruptcy or some, something of that sort, or there's a force major event. And, and often these direct lenders agreements tend to be rather complicated because the banks tend to, tend, tend to ask for safeguards that may not be acceptable from yeah. the country's fiscal balance sheet perspective. So, so yeah. the, it's very important that the direct lend, lenders agreement is also ring fenced, the ring fence to cover the specific risks that the lender would face on that specific project. And then the final aspect is the, what the investor wants are, is protection on various change of law provisions. What if okay. this tax changes and that tax changes in the future? Uh, so, so typically those issues can generally be covered under the investment agreements, whether it is in Sri Lanka, for example, we have what is called the Board of Investment Agreement, which is a direct contractual agreement with the, with, with, with the government, with the Board of Investment. And we have what is called a Strategic Development Projects Act. The final point I want to make is that a country cannot have a reputation of unilaterally breaking PPP agreements. If you, if you have such a reputation if, where in the past the PPP has failed due to a fundamental fault of the government, you are not going to attract bankable investors or bankable uh, projects or banks are going to look at this particular country with relatively unfavorably. So, so that is why, that is why it is always important because many first time PPP projects, you may not get the basic formula right in the first instance. Correct. Correct. Um, and, and that's one of the reasons why, uh, why uh, the, 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 the project that I mentioned earlier, there have not been too many, I would say less than 5% of Sri Lanka's PPP projects were renegotiated. Uh, but Correct. again, it must be uh, an interest based, rules based renegotiation which does not throw away the original concession agreement that was signed, but it is built right. on, on fundamental aspects that the government is uncomfortable with or the project investor is uncomfortable with. So the renegotiation yes. can be initiated even from the, from the part of the investor, but it must be rules-based. It must be within certain reasonable uh, framework. So that, that's, that's the reason why I, I, I feel that the, that the most key aspect for uh, financial closure and bankability of a PPP agreement is a the credibility of a country, of a finance ministry, and the PPP agency, and the reputation right. has established uh, in the past, or the reputation it, 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 it in, intends on establishing as it moves forward. All right. Okay. Okay. That's good to know, Kiran. Kiran, uh, I read about you that you are running an investment advisory called as TW Corp. Uh, what I want to understand from you is uh, how, now since you are uh, into investment advisory, how do you see the investment outlook for Sri Lanka? At least, I mean, especially after this entire pandemic hitting uh, for the coming quarters or the, for the current uh, business year. Um, I think the investment outlook for Sri Lanka is challenging. And that is why I feel the country is at the moment is going to pivot into a new paradigm of positioning ourselves uh, in the future based on three or four key competitive advantages that we have. One is obviously our human resources uh, in terms of uh, Sri Lanka's reputation as a value-added ICT exporter. 
we have, I mean, just, just as much as in India, uh, the, the ICT sector has grown. In Sri Lanka also, the largest, uh, most successful export-oriented industry we've had in Sri Lanka over the last 20 years has also been uh, ICT. And the government is actually promoting quite a few digitization initiatives to improve the digital infrastructure. And amongst these, there will be PPP opportunities without question. The, you mean to say the space, uh, PPPs? In the digital, digital uh, digitization space. Digitization space, yeah, okay. Precisely. There will be some that will be done as public investments. There will be some that will be done as uh, PPPs. And I'm aware of the government's ICT agency is going to work uh, very closely uh, with, the, with the president and the cabinet in, in this respect. And I, I, I also am one of the founders in Sri Lanka's largest IT university. And, uh, and, okay. and, the bo and, and the managing director of that organization is also represented in the country's ICT agency. Uh, the, okay. the, the next aspect of uh, growth will obviously be in the, in, in, in the, in the, in the logistics sector. So look at the, looking at the port of Colombo, the next terminal that is going to be available for a PPP, the government already has decided that there will be Indian investment interest in the, okay. in the next terminal. So, so the next PPP that will come to market, I believe the investors have already been sourced and identified. Uh, and uh, uh, Adani, Adani Group out of India has submitted a formal uh, expression of interest. And then the, the, the next element where there will be opportunity would be in, the, in, the, in and around the Hambantota port area uh, for logistics and supply chain related in, in investments where, as you see, as you will notice, there are disruptions to the, uh, the, the, the supply chain at the moment, uh, particularly in, the, in, in, in certain rubber-based industries. We are seeing a huge growth in, in, in Sri Lanka where either factories that are already in China are considering relocation or certain uh, companies in the West are looking at sourcing their, some of their products from alternative markets. So obviously India, uh, Vietnam, uh, Bangladesh are also going to be beneficiaries of this global value chain adjustment uh, that, is, yes. that, is, that is happening. And then of course, finally, uh, I, I, I must add that, uh, not finally, there are two more sectors I want to touch on. The other one being renewable energy. Uh, okay. Sri Lanka will very shortly publish uh, an RFP. Uh, the financial advisors to this transaction are the IFC of the World Bank for a 400 to 500 megawatts of renewable energy in the north of Sri Lanka. And I expect the renewable energy opportunities in Sri Lanka to grow by leaps and bounds. And, and obviously, I must also highlight that Sri Lanka generally does not go the unsolicited uh, proposal route. There's always competition that, that comes into play. Okay. Uh, though there have been the occasional unsolicited investment. And, and, and finally, the investment opportunity would, notwithstanding the global pandemic, would be tourism because Sri Lanka nevertheless had yes. still a relatively lower base of tourist arrivals, which grew from about 500,000 in 2009 when, when the conflict ended to 2 million in 2019, in 10 years, which is, which is quite a growth. And I myself, uh, as an investment banker, I'm, I'm seeing uh, top brands in, in, in the world who are, who are looking at Sri Lanka because they've now understood which markets are going to come back stronger. And because Sri Lanka right. responded positively to COVID and we had uh, really no major clusters or no major, major risks that were posed to tourists, or, or, or to citizens, um, I expect tourism investments to return starting from this year in anticipation of a normalization a, a few years down the road. And this is also helped by the fact that uh, the government, uh, this new government has made a decision to expand the port of Colombo and groundbreaking is expected to happen in a couple of months where our, our actual capacity will be more than double because we had a airport that had a capacity of 6 million that was handling 9 million passengers. Okay. Uh, and this is now going to be expanded to 15 million. So those That's would be the uh, option. And I must mention one final, final aspect, and that is really the importance of the port city as well as Hambantar. I did touch, touch on Hambantar as being the next logistics hub of the country. But Colombo port city, the government is implementing a new special economic zone law 
to set this up as an export oriented service hub whether it is financial services shipping etc so global headquarters or regional headquarters could locate within this special okay. economic zone without exchange control regulations and and the entire sees and legislation has been designed to provide top 20 top 25 ease of doing business uh, criteria notwithstanding the fact that sri lanka is way behind in 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 ease of doing business we are not in the top 25 by uh, we are actually slightly below india so so the government has recognized that we need to improve business transparency and 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 this particular experiment will happen within what is called the port city area which has doubled sri lanka central business district so that's okay. in 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 summary i feel the um, the 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 opportunities in 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 sri lanka and i must say that also the port city will be designed as probably your ideal city living environment in in, in a post covid uh landscape that's true. That's true. Away Our from viewers, crowded, I would say, crowded, I mean, crowded uh, cities, away from crowded cities. Yeah. Yes. I would echo with uh, Tilan's thought, uh, viewers, because uh, Sri Lanka is one country I've seen as the most resilient country. I mean, uh, it has bounced back to growth very soon. I mean, I, I remember the tsunami that hit the country very badly. And even after that, uh, the, the way it just came back, it was phenomenal. And what uh, Tilan is expressing his views and being an investment banker and having had an experience of 20 years running PPP projects, uh, I see a lot of positive growth and a lot of opportunities for global stakeholders to you know, come and be a part of investments in Sri, uh, in Sri Lanka. Tilan, my closing question to you is, um, now since I mentioned that, okay, you are a person who has you who, who knows the bureaucracy, who knows what goes in the public sector, you know how the private sectors react, one closing thought from you as to what would be your word of advice for global stakeholders who are considering investments in, in Sri Lanka? My, my advice would be do your research, look at the history of successful closure of PPPs in Sri Lanka, the fact that we have not had basket case transactions. Uh, the country's PPP framework is rules based. We have a commercial arbitration process and a, and a commercial court system that is uh, underpinned by English law. And to me, the most important aspect of a, of a PPP is the availability of sound bankable agreements. And Sri Lanka has over the last 22 years demonstrated that we have the required legal framework and we do not need to necessarily introduce uh, new laws. I've been constantly asked the question, does Sri Lanka need a PPP law? My view is no. Okay. So, so yes. in, a, in, a, in a nutshell, uh, uh, keep I, my advice to investors, keep your eyes and open, ears open to advertisements and, and global publicity that will be given to various PPP transactions in the pipeline. The new government will take a few months, obviously, to find its feet and, and the BOI to build its, uh, build its capacity. So, uh, so that would be my final uh, remark and comment on, on this matter. Thank you, Thilan. Uh, viewers, I must say, we, the, these were some insightful comments that we got about the market updates, about how the Sri Lankan market is evolving and the success it has seen for PPP projects. At least post COVID-19, when we see to market recovery, uh, our experience and our interactions with global stakeholders and leaders are reiterating the fact that PPPs is the way forward and seeing the success story of uh, Sri Lanka, I'm sure we all have many things to learn from them. I promise uh, we may we may consider having one more session with Mr. Thilan on some other topic, topic especially what he mentioned about the legal aspects. And uh, we would want to have a Thilan a special session with you, a separate one that discusses about how do you uh, uh, concretize or how do we build robust legal frameworks that are very essential for PPP projects. That would be uh, another separate session that we look forward to conducting with you. But uh, thank you so much, Tilan. Thank you for your views and comments and such detailed analysis and insights that you shared with us and for your time for your with P3 World Council. As P3 World Council, we are committed to support any such endeavors and uh, uh, things that advocate for PPP projects. So we would be both than happy to uh, assist the government in regards to taking this journey forward and uh, being a part of the success story of Sri Lanka PPPs. Thank you very much for your comments. Thank you, Thil. I look forward to being in touch with you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.